Nathan. Hey, uh, what's going on? on? Hey, good to have you here, man. Uh, we did a session earlier, I don't know if you uh, saw, on product branding and making sure that you stand out on the shelf and making sure that your product has a great experience. Nice. And I think now tying that together with product sourcing, we can think about how those things kind of play hand in hand in order to create the best overall product experience. I know you've got some great insights about things that have changed over the last few months and even the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I'll just let you uh, take it away and share everything you know, guys. This is Nathan from Sourceify. He is the go-to sourcing expert, I don't know, in the world. I, uh, who else? Yeah, would you <laughs> know, <man>? yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I appreciate uh, you having me on, Derek, and really excited to be here. You know, going to dive in just uh, head first because I've got a hard cut off in 20 minutes at 1210 because I actually, uh, I, I've got a wisdom teeth uh, removal at 1230. So, oh wish my gosh. Um, but, you know, we'll dive deep into the supply chain and try to, you know, really provide as much information as possible as quickly as possible. So, I'm going to share my screen and pull up uh, just some slides here. Um, everyone can see this, I would think, right? Awesome. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. So we're going to, we're going to dive in deep and, you know, ask questions as we go, go along, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll check the Q and a box or Derek can ask them as I go. But you know, my goal is to really enable you to understand your supply chain even better, you know, Sourceify, just a brief background. We have offices in China, Vietnam, India, Pakistan, and Mexico. So really well diversified across Asia. Um, you know, we produce products pretty much in almost every category, except for any like medical devices or anything you would eat. Um, and for me, I've been in the e-commerce world for 10 years. I used to live in China. I speak near fluent Mandarin. Um, and I've been, you know, producing products uh, in Asia for over 10 years. So what you'll learn today are really the seven keys to optimize your supply chain. Um, a lot of people probably, probably already know the difference between a factory, a trading company, and a sourcing agent. We're going to also tell you ways to benchmark your unit cost and then one massive hack to save money when importing, you know, if you're selling on uh, Amazon FBA. So I'm going to share these slides uh, with Derek and everyone else after. So if you have questions about, you know, these slides or these topics, just, you know, feel free to, to chime in whenever. Um, so when we think about a supply chain, we really think of a three pillar approach. We think of price, quality, lead time. You know, everyone wants the best price. They want the best quality, want the best lead time. It's a really hard balance to get the best of all three worlds. Um, and so you have to decide based on your product, you know, what matters most. For example, if you have a product where you have a lifetime guarantee, well, obviously the quality of that product is super important to you because you don't want it breaking and having to, you know, refund that product. Um, when it comes to manufacturing a new product, you know, we really look at three different kind of pulls, the interest, the margin and complexity. I would say most products, and this is a really important Important note, most products in the e-commerce world that are really scaling up probably start with about an 80% gross margin, meaning if they're selling a $100 product, they aren't spending more than $20 to produce that product. So margin is extremely important. Uh, and that really ties into, you know, your cost per acquisition and your operations overhead. Um, so all of that is extremely uh, important. I'd say if it's a higher price item, like, you know, we do some pretty expensive furniture where it's, uh, you know, seven, $800 price point. Um, you know, your margin doesn't necessarily have to be as high as long as you work in your shipping costs, um, because you probably aren't going to be spending more than, you know, $100, $150 to acquire a customer, uh, even at that expensive uh, price point of a furniture. So complexity is something else to consider. You know, you're going to have to pay for a mold. Uh, and what does that, you know, really look like? So when we think about paying for a mold, a lot of people think, oh, wow, I've got to spend you know, $15,000 on a mold. But what they don't really understand is that there's a break even point for every mold. And a lot of times by creating your own mold, you're number one, you know, obviously inventing and creating your own product. But number two, you're also protecting other people from just going out and stealing that idea. So obviously, e commerce is pretty competitive right now. And when you create your own mold, you're able to really, you know, protect that idea even further and make it so someone can't just, you know, start producing the same product overnight. And so, We've got a return on mold formula that I'll, I'll send you, um, or it's just on our website, sourceify.com. And, you know, the goal really is to um, basically break down the costs of, of, of the mold and what the break even metrics are like. So in this example here, you know, we've got a product that costs $20. Uh, there's, you know, a few other costs involved like tax and logistics and customs fees. So the total cost is $30. Your CPA, let's say is, you know, 20 bucks, you're selling it for $100. So you're profiting $50 on each product. 
So you only have to sell 300 units to actually pay for that mold. So your break even number from a unit perspective is 300 units to cover that $15,000 mold. Um, if it's a new product, I think the best approach is finding manufacturers that are similar to that product to produce it. So they can just iterate on similar designs that they already have. Um, and one of the best ways to kind of go about improving products in your industry is reading negative reviews on those products to identify problems that um, those products have. So the key question that we're going to ask right off the bat is, you know, are they a factory? Are they a trading company? Are they a wholesaler? You always want to work with a factory. That's, you know, first and foremost. Um, one cool trick that I'll drop right now is just called the picture trick where you write your, you have the factory sales rep, you know, obviously right now in the current situation in the world, not many of us are going uh, to, to Asia to visit these factories. You know, this is actually the first year in 10 years that I'm not going to Asia. Uh, it's, it's pretty nuts. Well, actually, I did go to Japan to, to ski in January, but that, that was not for, for business. Um, but anyway, so the goal here is to find a factory. And so you have your sales rep factory write your name and date on a piece of paper and have them go through the factory taking photos with that piece of paper and the image so you at least know they have access to that that facility that they say they're producing your product at um, because the reason why you don't want to work with a trading company or a wholesaler is it's easy for them to you know kind of hide or disappear and they're going to add margin to production so you know as we said trading companies take their own margin they have a usually a wide array of products and a lot of times let's say you're searching a marketplace like Alibaba, you know, a lot of times these trading companies will actually have, you know, that, that in their name, but this is a note to make clear that a lot of factories are also trading companies. So just because they have trade company in their name doesn't necessarily mean that they are a trading company. Um, but typically there's less customization that you can do. Um, and there's, you know, liability in question. So a wholesaler, you know, the benefit of working with a wholesaler is they typically have foreign representation. So maybe here, you know, in Los Angeles or, you know, wherever you're at, they might have foreign representation. There's a higher price, but you don't have to deal with the actual importation of that product. Um, but there is no real factory connection and there's very little customization. So the key to finding a factory, you know, is basically one of the challenges is cash flow in terms of uh, paying for inventory. A lot of times when you're starting with a factory, you're putting 30% down or 70%. Uh, upon shipment or upon delivery. And as you grow at that factory, you can get more payment payment terms. Um, and production lead time is also something you have to calculate as you grow. You know, obviously it's a challenge to forecast, especially right now when e-commerce is growing so fast. Number two question that we'd ask is if you are using a sourcing agent, what value are they providing up and down the supply chain? You know, typically you want to work with a sourcing agent that, that has very niche industry experience. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, I know the founder of Spikeball, they were originally working with a sourcing agent and they were working with the agent because he had very niche experience in terms of these plastic injection molds to produce their pieces and parts. And Spikeball has a lifetime warranty on their products. And so it was really, really important that the plastics were up to spec and meeting, um, you know, meeting their, their, their quality standards. Questions to ask your sourcing agent. Um, I'm not, not going to go through all of these, but, you know, you have the slides after to to you know, make sure they have this. One thing I'd recommend everyone do, and this is kind of mentioned here, is what is your quality control process? Before your container's loaded, um, when you're shipping out your products, make sure you do a third-party inspection. There's companies right now like Chima or um, V-Trust that will you know, charge, I think, $250, $300 to do like a one-man day uh, inspection. And it's so worth it because it's like a safeguard before you pay that remaining balance and before your container's loaded to make sure your products are what they say they are. Number three, your component costs. This is really a key. Most of the time when you're an e-commerce company, you're working with a contract manufacturer that um, you know, is putting the pieces together. They aren't actually the factory that uh, you know, is doing all the components. So they have, you know, for example, a watch. You might have the watch face, the watch, watch strap, the watch hands. All of those pieces come back to this main factory. Um, that you're likely dealing with, which is the assembly factory. And so each factory is going to have its own supply chain. And you're going to want to know the individual component costs to lower each unit cost. This is typically done at scale. You know, if you're just producing a few thousand units or even 10,000 units, a lot of times you might not have these details. But as you grow and as you start to place, you know, seven figure purchase orders, you're definitely going to want to know these component costs. And a lot of times you're going to want to know these component suppliers. 
Um, and this leads into your weakest link. So if you have a piece of your product that continues to break or that's faulty, you know, the watch hand keeps, you know, breaking or the watch strap is bad, you're going to want to really identify that problem sooner than later because typically it's one source that's causing delays or problems with, with quality. Um, another challenge is, you know, uh, your broken part solution is, is understanding how that factory is producing it, you know, the way it's engineered, you know, typically at Sourceify, we believe that the factory and their engineering team is going to know the products better than, you know, anyone else. Um, and so we want to understand where those raw materials are coming from and how it's interacting with other components in your product. So, you know, if something always causes delays, you might want to find another source for that uh, sub supplier and, you know, try to plan ahead through data. So if you know that the factory that produces the watch strap is always delayed by 20 days and getting the straps to your watch factory, well, you probably want to help them forecast that out as you're starting to place that new purchase order. Um, you know, one of my favorite watch companies, Original Grain, with their wood, they make wooden and stainless steel watches. Um, they really had to, you know, mitigate some of their supply chain risk with wood because, you know, they're having uh, some issues with wood in the past. So when it comes to knowing your communication methods, we always recommend to have at least two communication methods with your factory. Typically, a lot of people are just using email. We always recommend having WeChat, Skype, or WhatsApp as well. And keep it simple. You know, a lot of times you're just going to be working with one employee there. Um, but try to get to know at least two employees at that factory in case something does happen to that initial employee. Um, and the best way to go about that is just, you know, asking that employee, hey, you know, I just wanted, you know, to, to touch base in case something happens. Is there a secondary point of contact that I can have at your factory? Shipping methods. Um, I would assume most people tuning in are using a 3PL. Um, some, you know, might be selling through Amazon as well. Um, you know, the challenge with a large warehouse, which I think is really being discussed right now, or your own warehouse, is that there's just a lot of upfront costs in terms of the lease, in terms of the actual racks. Like, there's so much that goes into it that can cost a lot. Uh, but if you're just starting out, shipping yourself is really a great starting point. You know, Shopify or stamps.com can print your own labels, and it's really an effective way to actually understand your all in costs. Like, for example, when I was selling my own products online and just starting out 10 years ago. I was shipping all the sunglasses and hats and bags that we were producing myself. And it helped me understand everything from the you know, label cost to the actual shipping cost, which was really nice. Um, most people probably understand the typical 3PL setup. Um, and you know, these are kind of just different shipping methods that, that are possible. When you're thinking about a 3PL, you, know, you obviously want to understand their pick and pack fees, their storage costs, their packaging costs. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting and that is overlooked when it comes to 3PLs is the shipping costs are different. So, you know, these 3PLs, we're going to have sh different shipping rates between couriers. So, you know, FedEx and UPS uh, might charge shipping, you know, 3PLA a different rate to ship a product than they charge 3PLB. And so it's really interesting to make sure you understand the actual shipping cost that you're going to be charged. Um, and this is just, you know, an example, uh, pick and pack quote. Factory payments, um, one thing you can try to do, it's not as, as relevant right now, but if you can pay suppliers in, in native currencies, you know, as you grow, it can, you know, definitely help. If you can um, help with some of the FX exchange, you can potentially save on processing fees and get, get better payment terms from them. Um, tools to use when sending these payments in native currencies, Veeam, um, USYNO is for like smaller transactions. And, you know, I, I don't think I'd recommend this right now, but uh, in the past, you could set up a, a Hong Kong entity to, you know, do the exchange there. So how to set a benchmark price when you're starting out a new product category is, you know, type the product in the Google Translator. So let's say dog leashes. I'm trying to start producing dog leashes. I'm going to get this dog leash in Chinese. I'm then going to go on a website called 1688 and paste that dog leash term into this website, which is kind of like a Chinese based uh, Amazon, if you will. It's only for Chinese locals. Um, and then you can see, okay, well, this is how much it costs, uh, you know, to, to, to buy a dog leash in China. So it's like 4.4 yuan, 5 yuan, 7.5 yuan. Um, and so you can use this to baseline a cost when you're expanding into a new product category and compare your pricing to what's being offered on, you know, Alibaba or Amazon or, you know, whatever it may be. So you can kind of understand what your margin might be in that new product category. 
A bonus tip, uh, getting your vendor to ship directly to FBA. I'm not sure how many people here are selling through Amazon or through Shopify or other you know, e-commerce resources, but what we see a lot of people selling on Amazon doing right now is uh, saving money by uh, offshoring labor to enable their factory to do the FBA prep. It you know, obviously saves time and money, but you're telling the vendor, the factory, who your customer is, and the ugly here is you're really training them how to be you, um, which is really prevalent right now. It kind of, I think, uh, sucks for a lot of Amazon sellers where factories start selling direct in the same product categories because obviously as a third-party seller that doesn't own a factory, you can't you know compete with their pricing. Um, one more thing that I like to mention is that trademarks, patents, contracts, all of that are always protected at the border. It's not really worth the money or time to invest those resources into China and try to get patents in Asia. So you know you want to have of course non-disclosures and contracts with the factory. But the process that we see most people going through when they're creating a new mold is filing for a provisional patent. After they prove out the concept, they'll then change that into a utility patent. And then, of course, you have to you know, spend money to actually protect your patent if someone is infringing on it. So it's uh, a lot easier said than done. But you know, one of the best bets here, especially if you're focused on building a brand, is just simply getting a trademark under that brand name to protect it. One more thing. Um, we talked about this already, the picture trick but you basically have your sales rep, you know, write your name and date on a piece of paper and have them take photos with that paper uh, in their factory. At the end of the day, you know, I really believe e-commerce comes down to the numbers and brand, you know, outside of the brand to become profitable, you want to really aim for a uh, profitable conversion on a first purchase. A lot of people try to, you know, create this lifetime value calculation and say, well, over time we're going to be profitable. But I think the, highest growing e-commerce brands that we see, like you know, Manscaped or Movement Watches, they're usually profitable on first purchase, which is what you wanna aim for. Um, so what I wanna give you, you know, we've got our return on mold formula, we've got um, example standard production contracts and our product profit calculator. So I'll send these over to Derek and the team. Um, and if you guys have you know, more questions, feel free to just shoot me an email and I'll respond or someone on our team will respond. So that's, a really quick, quick overview. Did that in like 15 minutes. Usually I let this last like 30 minutes, but um, I wanted to save some time for like, you know, Q&A or chats. Um, so if there's any questions that are quick, um, you know, let's dive in. And I, yeah, I know you're dying to get your teeth pulled out. <laughs> no, I'm kind of scared, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Still, so, thanks for joining us uh, while, while being, uh, I'm sure, mentally distracted and preparing for um, for for quite a big um, event for you. Um, that was a really fast run through, but I think it was really crucial for a lot of people. I think the one question everybody has on that front of like, how do I really prevent them from copying me? And how do um, you said that the that like trademarks and patents they they like kind of stop at the border. They start at the border of the country. So if they are if there is a manufacturer in China that's selling the same product as me. Um, maybe I have something that's proprietary, but not patented. Yeah. You know, I think that's kind of common, right? In, in how they, how a product might be built or manufactured. So what can I do to protect them myself in the United States? Yeah. So what I would do, number one, if you start a new brand, file a trademark, that's easy and cost effective to do. You know, it costs like 300 bucks or something to file a trademark on the United States Patent and Trademark Office website. Um, and then have the right non-disclosures and contracts in place with your factory. With that trademark, you know, you can send it to our customer customs and border agency that will, you know, try to keep an eye out for those products as you're importing it. But, you know, really, I think the best bet over time is to, you know, file if it's a invention that has a, you know, new functionality that files for utility patent, file a provisional patent when you're starting out. You know, you could probably do that for a few thousand dollars rather than a full patent. But, you know, even with a patent, you're going to have to spend money to protect it. So I always believe in taking the stance of building a brand and brands really at the end of the day, they're protected through their name and that's a trademark, which is a lot more cost effective to get than a patent. Um, so besides having the right contracts and non-disclosures in place with your factory, I'd really focus on building the brand out and just protecting that brand through a trademark. Making sure your customers love you. That's been the yep. theme of, of the last two days. And in fact, this, this company here, the blend jet, you might know uh -huh. them as well. Um, they, you know, they, they, they invented the world's first portable blender. They patented it. 
it, uh, it works really well. It's simple. It's portable. It blends things. It's not like as industrial strength as a, as a full-on blender, but who needs that, right? What they did early on was um, they brought a lawyer onto the team, I think for something like two or 3% equity. And mm -hmm. it's a, a patent lawyer. And this person files like three cease and desists a week on wow. behalf of the company. And they mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to afford to pay this guy as a, a small and growing you know, brand that yeah. much money. But because he has equity in the company, he has this whole system set up uh, yeah. to squash all of the people trying to compete with them. And, exactly. and uh, you know, from a, both a patent and a brand standpoint, because people are trying to resell the exact same product. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, and then other people are just trying to make cheap knockoffs of it or whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah. So if you if you can get a lawyer on on retainer or in the company uh, to help you, especially if you have a patentable product. But if you can't, uh, yes, yeah, focus on building that brand moat. That it is, uh, it's what will always differentiate you. No one can steal uh, that relationship you have with your customers. Nathan, yeah. go! I know you got to run. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. And guys, if you're uh, guys and gals out there, if you're ever looking for product sourcing expertise, look no further than Sourceify and and Nathan and his team. Cheers. Wish me luck, everyone. And, and thanks again, Derek and the team for having me. And, you know, like I said, with manufacturing, it's a matter of just finding your factory. And if you have questions about that, you know, we're always happy to, happy to answer. Awesome. Talk to you later.